Hello, everybody. Uh, today we have Dom Francesco here with us. Uh, he's a fellow at uh, the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, he was originally trained as a mechanical engineer, uh, specializing in structural engineering uh, field. And uh, well, since his PhD, he has uh, been applying uh, Bayesian uh, modeling or Bayesian active learning. Uh, to various problems in structural engineering. And yeah, today he's gonna to give us an overview of what uh, what that looks like. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. Hi everyone, very happy to be here. Um, I don't think I have much to add to that introduction. Uh, my degree was in mechanical engineering and then I worked in the oil and gas industry. My specific job was assessing damage in structures. So, um, you might design a pipeline, but then wants to withstand a certain load, but once it starts to corrode or a crack develops, you need some analysis to show whether that's still safe. And um, I'll talk a bit about um, the work I did there. And then, yeah, the PhD, which ended up focusing on uncertainty quantification and decision support. And that's led to my uh, research role with the Alan Turing Institute now. And AQ Live, I've added here, that's just the consultancy we occasionally do bits and pieces of commercial work for. Mm. Okay. Right, uh, and I met a few of you at the, the IMAKI event recently, <clears throat> and I have this, this same quote, it's extended a bit here. This is from a, a famous fracture mechanics course that, that for the accompanying book, it's this uh, fracture mechanics course that's run in Sheffield. It says from a conservative starting point, engineers need to be dragged kicking and screaming towards the use of more complex models because they're not as well validated, more expensive, and they erode a safety margin, which engineers really value. And the author says he believes that's actually a good thing. So, and this, this image on the right here is this famous disaster in the North Sea where a platform exploded, Piper Alpha uh, platform. There's lots of literature online, failure investigations. And uh, the point here is I think within engineering, not just uh, you know the, the oil industry, but maybe across many industries, the consequences of getting things wrong can be very high. And for that reason, there's a bit more skepticism and a bit more resistance to playing around with different ways of uh, modeling, especially when you have something that appears to work. So uh, structures aren't falling down all the time. So that's an indication that the current methods, even if they are overly conservative or simple, are doing an okay job and you need to be quite brave to move away from that practice. Um, but I'll talk about the process and some, some visions I have for how you do safely incorporate some more complex methods, particularly around probabilistic methods, and uh, talk you through a bit of some, some examples from my, my research. So um, the particular standard that I worked a lot with was the British Standard 7910. And I'll use it in this presentation as well because it's a uh, um, very generic standard, it's for assessing damage in structures, so it wasn't just used in my industry. A lot of engineers will be familiar with this standard. And at the place I did my PhD runs the management of this standard. And this is one of the accompanying papers they wrote, but I think when they were uh, revising the standard. And this line that the aim of this procedure is to avoid failure and not predict failure. And I think already that goes in contrast to what we're typically trying to do in, in our field, which is predict failure and then quantify uncertainty around it and then drive decisions based on that method. Historically, um, engineers have had to act even when these complex methods of analysis were not available. And one way of doing that is by testing what works, finding something that works and sticking with that. And that's the historic use of the standard, and there's some challenges in moving away from those workflows. Um, but the current methodologies in a lot of industries will be about avoiding failure in engineering. More fundamentally, though, the reason engineers do analysis is to support decision making. And this is like a decision event tree representation of the generic problem that engineering is trying to solve which is how to intervene in their system, when, if ever, to invest in risk mitigation, how that will affect structural condition that you have some models for, and 
if you formalize it in a decision theoretic way, you're looking to take the action that maximizes your utility over this space. Um, yeah. So I'm trying to relate this to, to the problems in these examples. So focusing first on some models for structural condition, um, at the IMAC event, a, a popular topic was fatigue. And this is um, when a crack exists in a structure and it's loaded, not so much that the crack will fail, but um, at that kind of amplitude repeatedly, and then the crack grows incrementally. And that's how that's a common failure mode for lots of engineering components. And this standard gives some advice on how to model future crack growth in different environments. And these are the models that I used in my job all the time, kind of without questioning. You had this um, linear, and then it was revised to be a piecewise bilinear crack growth rate, where along the x-axis, you've got something that's uh, proportional to the load that's being applied on and off. And on the y-axis, you've got how quickly the crack is growing if it's being loaded cyclically in that way. So you perform your, your stress calculation, look up how quickly that crack will be growing, do some forecasting, and try and identify when you need to perform your mitigation before it fails. As part of my PhD, I dug into some of the underlying data of, of that um, model. And eventually I found this justification for the use of the bilinear model. And it was simply, it was from a, a spreadsheet in the 1990s, but it's still the basis of the calculations that engineers are performing today. And the justification is that the form of the data suggests that the best fit will be this bilinear piecewise regression, um, which was a little alarming that there wasn't something more substantial there. But I guess the informal justification is we're using these methods and, and they're working, people are getting to things in time. So yeah, as I say, as part of my research, I looked into the, the data a bit more. This is the data set that um, is used to create those models. Uh, you can sort of see what they mean when they say it appears to be bilinear, but, um, but you'd hope you could justify that in a bit more of a quantitative way. But yeah, as part of my research, I, I use the Bayesian methods to fit this model, get a joint posterior distribution of all of your parameters, using probabilistic programming. My preferred uh, software was STAM. So I, I did this for comparison. But then I found out that this test data was actually um, an aggregation of lots of different tests. And this was important because these tests were done under slightly different conditions. They didn't all have the exact same material or um, load ratio and, and a few other properties. But I guess at the time when this analysis was performed, they just threw it all together. And that has the effect of you lose the ability to account for the variation between the tests. So, so I extended this work to, to fit a hierarchical model that partially pulled between these, these data sets. Tried to quantify the, the predictive performance of a few of these different models. I looked at a few um, metrics. Um, but they all had this pattern where the existing guidance was not um, as accurate as a Bayesian model, presumably because of the dependencies between the parameters. And then by accounting for that variation between the constituent test data sets, you could improve the predictions even further. And so then I spoke to the people that were running the standards and said, you know, if you do analysis in this way, you can get better predictions. And they told me through the process of adding new methodologies to this existing standard. And they said the way it would typically be done was it, it would be presented as first an alternative methods, maybe in an appendix, and then in the next edition, if it was something to be used, it might be used alongside the current methods. And then it might be three or four editions before it's actually recommended in the standards even if today you're showing it's performing better. And this standard is revised every, no, not periodically, but approximately every three or four years. <laughs> so you're talking of three or four iterations of the standards, it's, yeah, maybe a decade before your work meaningfully makes it into the standard. Um, but this standard has been going since, for, I don't know, nearly 50 years, and it's been iterative, iterated in this way. So um, that's the way it currently works. 
this is a very widely used and adopted standard. It might be a bit more flexible in more niche standards or guidance documents, but you'll still have this, uh, this possible barrier. Um, there are two main focuses of this standard. One is forecast, well, yeah, I think that's fair to say. One is forecasting future crack growth, and then the other is trying to estimate what we would call the limit state, the point at which the crack becomes predicted to fail. I'll just briefly talk you through what this diagram is, um, again, because it's very widely used when assessing damage in across lots of different engineering. On the y-axis here, you have a proximity to a brittle failure. So it's a, it's a ratio of your linear elastic crack driving force against your fracture toughness, which is resisting that fracture. And when you exceed the fracture toughness, in theory, you fail in a brittle manner. Along the x-axis here, you've got um, ductile plastic failure, proximity to yield. When the load exceeds the yield, the strength of the material, then in theory, you is connect these two domains. And I can't, I don't think I've put in the equations used in the standard, but we can have a look at them afterwards, maybe. But it's purely empirical. There's no um, underlying physics. It's, it's finite element simulations, modeling, and and then um, and testing, constructing these lines. These dots are not labeled on this plot. These are um, to set points where, where you've, where you've experience failure in a particular geometry, a plate with a crack. Um, they do the calculations of LR and KR and find out where it's failed. And then they draw these lines, which we assess to in the standard. And as you can see, this is not a regression through these points. This is, if you're, if you're within this region, you, you're labeled safe. And that's because we've not experienced in the lab a test that's failed under these conditions. And if you're above this line, what they call it is potentially unsafe. That's how it's labeled in the standard. Is this is this one material under the same experiment, or is there different materials in these? It could be different materials, and that will be adjusted by the because the denominator here is strength. I just meant the dots. Are they oh, like? Are you? Yeah, are that's all different one. material. Oh, right, this in is the, replicates of one thing. That you've standard is a huge data set across different geometries, materials, everything, and this is one data set. Same material, same type of geometry, and still we have this variation. So and still fail in different ways, in a brittle way or in a last. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. So, um, that can also depend on how you load it as well. Yeah. But you can still experience that. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, and that, that, that's, that's how you interpret it. If you, if you did an assessment and you're within this region, you could say to your clients that we've demonstrated it's safe. And if you're outside of this region, you'd have to, even if you expect it still to be safe, because you can see some of these points are failing way up here, and you may be much closer to this, this failure line, you'd have to say, it's not past this assessment, you need to take some action. And there are some ways of introducing more uh, complexity to your model to kind of either bring this curve up or bring these points down with better modeling of residual stresses and things like this. But you still have this. Um, different approach of demonstrating safety rather than predicting failure. Do, do you think that uh, there is enough uh, data or like data is also not really collected because now you have this standard like established on the data, but does that also kind of somehow prevents collecting new data to actually, that would uh, make it easier to revise the standard? Um, there's, there's a lot of data that have been collected over the past like 40 years that um, this organization holds and new tests are still conducted every now and then when they want to maybe test something specific that will get added um but yeah i think it's more than enough data to to use a data driven approach to to model this this behavior this standard also has um some annexes like i say where you can explain how to do more complex modeling. And they've introduced one annex on probabilistic modeling. Um, but I would suggest that this approach is not directly compatible with probabilistic modeling because the reason we quantify uncertainty is to, to see how close we are to failure 
um, rather than you can you can't directly add add a uncertainty quantification to to this line. And I think this is a sort of source of confusion at the moment. Um, this paper outlines this probabilistic annex, and they use this same assessment line that's below all the points or the test space that they have. And they, I think they're doing some um, sampling from a Gaussian error in measurement here. And they're describing the ratio of points outside of this curve to points inside of this curve as the probability of failure. When, as we've seen, this is not a, a failure line. What you're ending up with is a probability of being potentially unsafe. Mm. And that kind of negates the, the purpose of, of doing this um, uncertainty quantification. Um, but this is this is kind of the this is a few years ago now, but that represented the current state of the probabilistic component of this standard. So spoke a bit about annexes. So I wrote another paper that tried to do this as a regression. This is um a purely empirical relationship between these two domains, and I use the Gaussian process to to fit these these points. I use the mean function, which um, which I'll talk about a bit more later, and did some prior sampling, some posterior sampling, um, and then got this regression, which accounts for uncertainty. Counts for measurement error in these points, if you're wondering why those, these seem so unlikely. And in theory, gives you a best prediction of failure accounting for uncertainty. And we talk, I've, and then I would speak a lot about probabilistic models being more informative and more valuable, and use a couple of use cases to help demonstrate this. Um, first one is what they call structural reliability analysis, which is predicting the probability of failure. And I thought of an example of being just within this curve, and therefore, according to the standards, passing. But actually, your probability of failure wouldn't be zero in that case, because you could be, if you imagine this was a test point, that could be a justification for moving the line down in future standards. Um, but if you had this, this predictive distribution over the whole domain, you could find your probability of failure at any point. Similarly, if you're just outside the line, you might have a very comparable probability of failure, which this um, kind of discretization makes a big distinction about. And so run some examples where you would calculate that. And then also probabilities are then directly compatible with the decision analysis, which this current analysis is not. Uh, oh, no, sorry. And then I spoke about um, how you can also use this to then inform future testing to make sure you are targeting the areas of the most uncertainty, which I believe you guys have a lot of experience in. And it also derive a new boundary that is like iso iso probability line, right? Uh, or probability of failure. Yeah, yeah. Right, so then it would be actually, uh, actually there is more space over there that uh, gives you same probability of failure, for example, in the lower corner. Yeah, and if you're on that line, so, you have yeah, a, uh, left. A, 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 um, a tolerable probability of failure, maybe. Yeah. But yeah, but yeah, you're right. Uh, in, in effect, this is what this, this is tolerable probability of failure, right? Because there's practice. Probability. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's not being um, considered in that way, but effectively it is because of how it's dealt with. Um, but yeah, you could, yeah, so then you could inform future testing by targeting the areas with the most uncertainty which is what this is um, here in this, this particular data set I chose because it had a consistent um, characteristics, didn't have any data in this regime, um, which I think is why it was very important to include a mean function because actually you do know um, the purpose of the assessment diagram and how it should tail off here. Uh, otherwise you get very unrealistic high uncertainties if you just had a, a zero mean Gaussian process, for example. So, um, the mean function kind of helps address that. And then this is where we are with what in my terminology, what I would describe as traditional experimental design, where you're targeting the areas that reduce uncertainty the most or maximize information gain by some measure of entropy, however you want to define it. 
Um, but then I found that in certainly within some engineering research now, and certainly in communicating with engineers, um, I think I speak about it in a few slides time. I then directly connect this to the decision problem as to why, why the data is being collected, why the analysis is being done. And then when you have those utilities on the end, you quantify the value of information and you say this is, so even if this is your most worthwhile point uh, to collect data, you can then quantify how much you should be willing to pay for a new test at that point, which is a bit more interpretable. And then this is another very generic topic that comes up a lot, uh, usually called risk-based inspection. And again, the high level aim is, is, I think we can all get on board with, where you direct your resources towards the components in your system that are the highest risk. Um, but then there's also very complex ways you could model that and then very simple uh, decision rule heuristic based ways you can model that as well. So this quote comes from a, a popular standard used in the energy industry from API. And I think it sounds great. Uh, they talk about inspection effectiveness. Um, well, first of all, inspection reduces your uncertainty in your system. And then the extent of that reduction depends on the effectiveness of the inspection, which sounds great. But then uh, I've got a few quotes. This standard is very, the, a lot of the American standards I found were, in my old industry, were kind of very procedural as opposed to what they term goal setting, where you're following a very rigid procedure. You look up a value in a table that sends you to this section. You look up a value, you get to your results, and then that's how you follow the procedure. Again, they discretize here. They talk about five categories of inspection effectiveness and assign a value. It's purely up to the engineer to decide where he is here. There's a little bit of guidance. And then their, their prior distribution is, again, from a lookup table based on this, um, I mean, this particular standard is unique because it, it calls this method Bayesian, whereas other, others don't. Um, I can't remember if I, just in case I don't have a slide on it later, I, I also did some research on mathematically characterizing the different features of engineering data. So precision, bias, reliability, missingness. You can do this all mathematically and build that into your likelihood function. And then you can show how different qualities of data affect your estimates in a more quantitative way. And you can also show how data of different qualities offers different financial value to you in different circumstances as well. But I'm sure I will get onto value of information. So just a quick question, the utility, so for computing this value information. Yeah, uh, I I've, I've mentioned it now, but I think I have some for examples yeah just uh, just as a better matter of context like uh for the for example for judging whether the whatever uh the is it a, perhaps a, like a, a bridge or a building like for determining whether it's a safe or potentially unsafe so the, the, the value comes the utility comes from there uh, comes from the um com or components of the bridge for example yeah the outcomes of your interventions or lack of intervention so it could be a component failing and then you'd have to think about the work necessary to repair and reinstate it. It could be a whole structure failing. Consequences would be much higher. Um, and in the extreme cases, it could be something like that example we saw at the start where the uh, platform exploded and I think nearly 200 people died. And then there's, um, yeah, there's either for, through, through lawsuits and insurance companies, there's ways of quantifying those costs. And there's also a method which I don't talk about here called the life quality index, which is what engineers use in research, which if you talk about consequences of loss of life, you don't put a value on life. What you quantify is a society's capacity to commit resources, how much you could spend to save a life. Um, and then, yeah, they, they pretty much align anyway. But, um, but it's those kind of outcomes. That's where your utility comes from. And reducing uncertainty in that system then relates how much you should be willing to spend on data on that scale. Mm -hmm. But hopefully some examples will make that a bit more clear. So it's a really challenging task to standardize these kind of procedures. Standards are important because um, without them, you could be allowing stuff much more dangerous than this. 
to inform very consequential decisions, but it does introduce these unhelpful heuristics and discretizations where your components might be considered either completely unique or completely representative of a wide population. You have these qualitative risk levels and relative, relative risk, which are not directly compatible with decision analysis. And also some, uh, some standards talk about um, more detailed methods requiring much higher quality data and much more data. They don't think you can do probabilistic analysis with smaller data sets, which of course is not the case. Yeah, okay, so um, data that's often collected on, on certainly the, the assets I used to work on is like an indirect measurement of a really complex physical phenomena, maybe in challenging conditions. So it could be a, a, a pipelines are inspected by these, these robots that get pushed through the pipe that are loaded with sensors, and they might not be moving at the exact same speed that they were designed to. Um, they're verified by digging a trench and having someone in a trench taking measurements that also has its own constraints being offshore, might be someone hanging from a rope or a robot subsea. There's all sorts of reasons why the data won't be perfect, even though it's very valuable data. It's very expensive to collect, and it is uh, the way you define your likelihood function is very important because you want to account for these features of your data. So then more fundamentally, um, the question you want to ask is, when do you need to collect data to help inform your decisions? How good does it need to be and how much should you be willing to pay for it? And there's a statistical uh, approach to, to solving this problem. There's nothing new in statistics, but it has been relatively new in engineering research. Maybe that's say the past 10 years or so, we've been seeing more more papers, sometimes very simple, but now, now a lot more detailed. Um, so before I presented this, this fundamental decision problem to engineers, when do you need to intervene in your system? And you can extend this by saying, before I need to make this decision, I also have the opportunity to collect some more data. And then um, my expected value of information is my expected utility with this data minus my expected utility without this data. And the, uh, well, as you guys work in, in this area, so you know the, the challenge of having to integrate over all the possible things you could measure based on your model. So I won't elaborate on that. But okay, so one example here is um, we've got some structure here with, with three sites of active corrosion, and this other location with more uh, corrosion. And do we have, yeah, okay. So a very simple corrosion model that, that was certainly getting used in industry when I was working there. It's just a linear regression. You're trending how your material is thinning. And I think it's still fair to say that over small periods of time, that's a reasonable assumption. It's, it's non-linear over much longer time scales. But, um, but yeah, over these three sites of corrosion, we have these top rows that were measured at the first point in time and the second row that was measured in, this, in the second inspection, uh, some years later, I've, I've linked to all the, all the papers for where there's more information. Um, and here we're saying that this measurement was not completed, which is another thing that's quite common, particularly when you're sending people to these, these kind of uh, offshore platforms, for example. Um, weather constraints is a common reason why people need to be moved on and offshore or work can't be done. So what we want to quantify is the expected value of returning to this site now, now it's clear, and taking this measurement. So there's a few things to think about here. Firstly, the two, the two topics I think in my PhD that really uh, struck a chord with me as why are these not more widespread in engineering are decision analysis, value information analysis, and hierarchical modeling, because this is also a very common scenario where you have a lot of data at this analogous point and you want to make use of it somehow, all engineers will justify in their head some reason why they can or can't combine data sets. And actually the answer is, will this inform your prediction of the corrosion right here? To some extent, it depends on how similar they are. 
and that's that's what hierarchical modeling uh, gives us. So, value of information analysis is then very, or all based analysis is very dependent on prior models. I suggest they could be particularly scrutinized in value of information analysis because um, your result is so dependent on, on your representation of what you know currently. And that can be quite hard to justify and it can feel arbitrary. So what we've done in this case is jointly estimated the corrosion growth rate and what we would expect to measure here. So we impute this probabilistically as if it was missing data. And then that forms our estimate of what we would expect to measure and our basis for the, the value of information analysis. And we can um, get, a, get less uncertainty in that estimate if we allow for sharing information between the two sites. Likewise, for the corrosion growth rates at the top row here where we had all the data, we get a little bit of benefits. At the second location where we didn't have much data, we get more benefit by, by showing the information. And, um, and yeah, in this particular paper, I tried to combine the two topics of quantifying the value of um, collection of engineering data and partially pooling data. And actually your estimate of your value of information is also dependent on which approach you use as you'd expect. Um, I don't know if you guys have, have often explicitly connect your models to your decisions so you quantify the value of data collection in monetary terms or just as a priority. But I found that, that um, I think as you saw at the conference, I had some experience of talking to engineers on this topic then, and I was quantifying the expected value of model verification using this exact framework. Um, but I use real, real numbers and a real example. And I said, by verifying your model, you're exposing yourself to effectively to $30,000 less risk per year. And that was very easy to follow conceptually. Okay. So a lot of the literature on this topic within engineering was very focused on kind of a marginal analysis of collecting this type of data in this context. And there's been a lot of focus on something called structural health monitoring, which is bridges and structures are now being built with sensors already in them. And that's, that's called structural health monitoring. They're normally measuring um, the strain gauges, so indirectly measuring the load on the structure, for example. Um, so there's a lot of work on, so all of the value of information work is very focused on this because it's a new, exciting technology. And it's definitely worth investigating because um, there's a bridge I was working on with, with these sensors already in, and within a year of, of it going live, a lot of the sensors were failing already. So then you can quantify the expected value of preparing, preparing that sensor, or do you have sufficient data from the surrounding sensors? It's a nice way of answering that question. And um, this would be for, okay. And this is a way, a way I'm currently uh, visualizing value of information results where I'm saying, we're not sure exactly what we're going to measure, but we consider this whole domain. And in instances where we measure very low, in this case, stress concentration, we're justified in taking no action in our upcoming maintenance window. And as we progress to instances where we measure very high stress concentration, we then are expected to need to take more substantial action. And if we average over all these simulations, we get this dashed line and we can compare that to what our decision would have been based just on our prior model. And then I'm kind of talking the way through the, the way the calculation is done. And then this difference then is that difference we saw in the equation earlier, which is how much better off you are with, you expect to be with this data and that's how much you should be willing to pay for the data. So that's the same single marginal approach. What's the line representing in terms of decision? Sorry? What is the line representing? I'm sorry, I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. Like, what kind of action do you take? So, this uh, solid line mm -hmm. has, has an associated action. It's based on the prior decision analysis, and it's not labeled on this graph. This dashed line is the average over all of these simulations. So each point here has an associated action, okay. um, but, that, but the action depends on what you will measure when you do the investigation. And um, and so this dashed line represents 
all the possible actions you could take depending on what you measure. But this, yeah, you're right. This dashed line is a single decision analysis with an associated action that will be in the paper, but just is not labeled on this graph. Is that what they would have done if well, you if not if you didn't bother looking at this? This is like that's like what what action they would have taken. You said it's a prior that prior it's the expected like, optimal conditional on the prior. Is that what they would typically do in the first place? I mean, like you would do the thing that you would expect to be not there. necessarily because by this stage you're already to get to this point you've already done some probabilistic reasoning, okay. um, but generally, yeah, I think that's fair, but not necessarily. It's yeah, once we have once we formalize it with our probabilistic models, then we can find our expected optimal action, and that's the basis of this calculation. Mm -hmm. It's a different route to what's often done in industry. So, like I say, the research is focused on kind of a marginal. This is one measurement opportunity to measure this thing. Actually, I think a more common engineering system is you have uh, a strength or a resistance to a load, an applied load, and some geometrical factor, stress concentration. And I think a diagram, like an influence diagram like this, uh, are you guys all familiar with influence diagrams? It's like a, Bayes a Bayesian network where you have this, um, this causal association but as well as just your probabilistic nodes, you also have square decision nodes mm -hmm. and maybe triangle or diagonal uh, utility payoff loads. So you can propagate your uncertainty through your uncertain nodes, optimize your combination of actions, that, which maximize your utility through your network. I should have had a simpler one to, to start with, but this is one that talks about different uncertainties in your system. And this uh, this triangle was one that came up a lot in uh, in fatigue and fracture mechanics where I used to work in. Uh, ECA triangle, they call it, a load, a resistance of load, and a geometry. These are the three things you need to consider when doing this kind of assessment. And actually, for each of these, you have the opportunity to take some measurements and reduce uncertainty, and you have the opportunity to intervene and adjust this somehow. So it's a kind of wider, I think this paper is called system effects because it's looking at a wider system and still applying this methodology. Um, and these all then inform your uh, probability of failure and that informs your expected failure cost. Um, yeah, the way the way this analysis was done um, is with um, yeah, a probabilistic model that related all of these and then just a uh, optimization library that, um, that found the optimal combination of all of these actions. And once you start looking at trying to apply this to a wider system, you get what, what I'm calling here system effects, one of which being that the value of collecting these different types of data don't just sum linearly, which I thought was quite an interesting finding. Um, so for example, The expected value of doing material testing was quite low because commonly, but not always commonly, you already have a good understanding of your material properties. Well, there one reason for this paper, it was, folk was talking about how uh, this is a hot topic at the moment, embedding sensors in your system. But I remembered cases where I was asked to um, assess pipelines and they couldn't even tell me what material it was. The optimal strategy then would not be to put sensors on it, it would be to try and understand some more fundamental properties. But yes, yeah, so you have a small expected value of testing in this case. But actually, once you have data from your sensors, you don't get any further benefit from testing. And um, I didn't go into this more quantitatively. I just um, talked about how introducing this data then fundamentally changes your decision problem. You have different limiting factors, so it kind of follows that you won't have the same effects of collecting other data. You've got a different um, state of knowledge. so. Um, it's kind of reasonable that these would not sum linearly. But just producing separate marginal uh, analyses, you might be tempted to just add them together, but then you lose this uh, system representation. So when you say not linear, you mean sublinear rather than like, I don't know, they're more useful in combination than they are individually? Or less. Oh, they can, they can be, they can be. In this case, it was less. I, I ran another case where collecting two things together was had an expected benefit that was greater than the sum of them. 
but um, but yeah, they combine in, in possibly non-intuitive ways when you look at them in the context of the system. Another thing that was particularly of interest was forecasting lots of future windows, maintenance windows. And then up to this point, I was still running this just as a linear program, although your decision space grows exponentially the more windows you have to forecast. And so current work we're doing is looking at longer forecasts and then using reinforcement learning to approximate the optimal policy in all of these steps. Uh, yeah, conditional on your models because it just becomes infeasible to, to use this method beyond this. So here, the sequence of actions also matters. And this is the, this is the same result for the, the three-year period. So where we are at the moment in engineering is we have this, uh, these new ways of collecting and analyzing data that are entering lots of different uh, industries and present an opportunity to, to solve problems in a different way. However, some of the methods that we would typically go to to analyze this kind of data will not always be compatible with the historic approaches that are still being used. And I think this distinction comes down to demonstrating safety versus quantifying reliability. We need to talk about how quantifying reliability opens up doors to optimization and decision support, which the previous approaches don't. And I think the way around it is, is the approach is there'll be a reluctance to adopt these methods when there is still a pressure to comply with the existing standards. So it's at a very early stage, but we're, we're proposing some work at the, uh, at the Allen Turing Institute where we could uh, possibly contribute to some new engineering standards. There's an AI standards hub at the, at the Turing Institute that's kind of collating data on new engineering standards at the moment. But I think these new standards need to be more open source because I spoke a little bit about how difficult it was to dig into the underlying data of the current guidance in the existing standard. There's no clear path to where these recommendations come from. It's just that they're used and they're working. Um, so I think it needs to be more open. I think you could then build a community around that kind of standard or workflow. You could get people checking things, contributing to things. Um, I think people entering engineering now will have the necessary skills to do this. Um, but yeah, certainly at the moment, I think it's a barrier for the adoption of these methods. And yeah, I think that's all I have for now, but happy to chat in a bit more detail. Thanks. For well, one of the values you showed in the last few slides, you were relying on simulation for like, like this one, for instance. You just propagate massively all your uncertainties, and which is how you quantify the value of actions. Through your model and through your um, network of possible interventions. So here we're still comparing our expected optimal utility with and without the data. Uh, and it's just pushed through through this uh, influence diagram. These values here, because these are academic papers, are normalized. So this will be a, a proportion of the cost of failure. Um, if you had a real case, you could then um, use real values here and say this combination of uh, data collection in your next window will reduce your risk exposure by X uh, euros or whatever. So the, the computational aspect is one of the big challenges you have to face here, or is it doesn't get too much in the way? So the, all the models we saw in this presentation are relatively simple, I'd say, uh, not too high, not too high dimensional. Where I hit computational challenges was forecasting it through multiple windows. And um, there's already some work that's been done, not by me, on demonstrating that reinforcement learning is a good alternative to approximating policies where the decision space is just too, too big to exhaustively explore. Yeah, uh, thanks, it was really, really interesting. Um, you mentioned you also had that aspect of, of our models <clears throat> that weren't being widely adopted at the start. Yeah. Um, and I think that's true in other fields as well, like machine learning is underutilized. And they are very, very powerful. But on the flip side, mm -hmm. my concern would be they're very hard to evaluate. And if you're wanting to know the 95 percentile packs, and how do you know your HNC run is, your HNC run is that accurate or has converged to that level of accuracy? 
So, so I mean, I'm a big, don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of them, but I would, I guess if I was being super conservative, like you need to be in these kind of situations, I would worry, uh, how are you confident in your posterior, especially in the tails? Yeah, I'm, I'm just using the, the standard um, MCMC diagnostics that, in theory, give some evidence that you've uh, converged and, and, and explored the space and the tails are good. But, um, but yeah, they would need more thought, for sure. Yeah, I'm just that was okay, but I am a big fan. I'm just uh... the uh, the, the challenges are yeah, it, it, but you need more care when using them for sure. But the applications are just everywhere. I was at an AI and healthcare event recently. I got invited by someone, and I was reluctant to go because I don't know anything about healthcare, and I only know a tiny bit about AI. <laughs> and um, and they were talking about they need they don't know how to translate a population estimate to a single patient. And they need to talk about how frequently they need to collect data from a patient um, because there's these standard rules that they'd like to do it based on the data, they, what the information you have about the patient. And there was just so much overlap with the exact same challenges here. And it comes down to identifying the, the statistical approaches that solve these problems um, kind of more formally. But then you, yeah, you certainly then hit that stage of now you need a lot more care when. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost a black box in the sense it's really hard to figure out to just justify. I mean, hopefully it's only not a black box because you can see exactly what the maths is, but you, to try and explain to someone why you've got those confidence intervals there is quite a, it's quite challenging. So I thought I'd had a comparison of the full posterior predictive distribution for the fully pooled equivalent yeah. and, the, um, and the hierarchical model when I showed the wider spread and I talked about the observations that were currently way outside of the current predictions yeah, yeah. and how it wouldn't be able to foresee that coming, whereas the hierarchical model would. And I explain that as an additional source of variation, the variation between the tests that were done in these different labs all over Europe that they were just throwing together. And um, yeah, I think focusing on conceptual explanations for, for, for those kind of things is quite helpful. Yeah, that's great. How, how do you, uh, I think you like started off the presentation with uh you know, uh, you know, like a, a, a warning, I guess, and, mm -hmm. and how and how you, you felt like that was probably justified. But then at the end, it's like an, adv an advocate for standards which move faster than these traditional standards. So like, how, how do you resolve those two things, I guess? Okay. There's one topic that I've not spoken about in here, but is a big uh, area of my current research, which is model assurance and verification. And I think that just takes a much more prominent role then when you're using new methods. Uh, digital twins is a, a thing in, in many industries now, but it's novel in engineering as well. And we, and they're being introduced and regulators need a way of saying whether they're safe or not. And we did a, uh, a verification of the digital twin for a component on a ship. <laughs> Very small steps to, to full digital twinning. Um, but our analysis formed part of an argument that was eventually accepted by a regulator that this could be used. So, yeah, these are kind of long-term, bigger goals, and it will be very incremental. But I think, yeah, model verification and assurance will be a big part of that. Yeah. So that means that you would be able to use your kind of simulator to actually assess whether something is uh, good enough or not. For, for, that com for that model of that component on that ship, okay. um, the regulator said, um, we're happy it's safe to use. And regulatory approval, I guess you guys know from your... Uh, Work in the automotive industry can be a big barrier, but uh, by targeting things and demonstrating that uh, you've, you've verified them, even though they're more complex, they're, they're safe to use. I think will happen in, in small steps, but will slowly happen. Okay. Um, anybody online who has a question? Yeah, that sounds good to me. Okay. If anything um, comes up or you, you want to chat, um, feel free to share my details. Always happy to chat about engineering uncertainty decisions. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.